Hi, it's Gadget UK here again. Uh, as you can see, we're back with the Atari 65 XE here. Uh, this was the one I repaired in the uh, previous video that had the keyboard problems and things. So what I'm going to do is I've got some 7.4 LS 95s here, some 16-pin uh, dip sockets, some DRAM, which I'll show you later, and the e is it EMMU chip, I think it is. Uh, just to allow you to address the extra uh, 64k of RAM. So I'm going to increase this from 64k to 128k. And as shown in previous videos, uh, four screws. You've got a screw there, a screw there, a screw there, and a screw there. So I'll just disconnect the keyboard. And when I was last in this, I only uh, twisted a couple of these twists because I knew I'd be coming back in here again. Um, and I'll probably do the same actually when I reassemble it, just, just twist a couple of them. Um, I might actually do none of them actually when I put it back together because I will be going back in this uh, in a short period of time just to do the pokey stuff, add a second pokey. So looking at the board here now, I'll just zoom in. Uh, there we go, it's about close enough. You can clearly see here the spaces for the additional RAM, so the first thing I'm going to need to do is get some desolder braid and unblock. Uh, the pins there so I can get sockets on. I'll probably do that first I think. Um, you can see U34 here, we've got a couple of res three resistors. Um, I think that's where the, uh, what do we think, is it going to be the 75? It might not be. No, the 75 is going to go down here I think in the U35 spot. If I put that side on, yeah that's the right number of pins. Um, and then the Atari chip, what have I done with it? Yeah, the interesting thing with this is this is quite a small chip. U34 is quite a large socket there, so I'm not quite sure where that goes, actually. So, a bit of a sense check here. Um, <coughs> straight away there, that confused me. I was under the assumption from something I'd read that we would need to put a 7.4 LS95 down here, um, and then this Atari chip, or a GAL. Um, I think that's where I'd previously read when I was looking into these things a few years back, I remember finding an article suggesting that you could program a, a gal or a pal, I think it is, it might be, um, and stick it in this slot here. Um, and it was it filled the you know it was the same size package as the the dip profile there. But as you can see, this Atari part number here, and it's uh, C zero two five nine five three dash twenty. It's supposed to go in here, U34, but obviously it's smaller. So I mean, yeah, my first thought was okay, it's left aligned, but then. Is it the right chip? You know, because it is a larger profile socket there. Um, so, like I say, coming back to this here for just to zoom in, I've just went looking for um, photos of the one six, uh, sorry, the one thirty XE board, because that's a, a good way of uh, checking this. Um, yeah, you're not going to be able to see very well, but you can see the chip doesn't fill the profile there. So, yeah, that's the, the Atari part number does go in that uh, socket there, left aligned, you know, aligned to pin one, um, and there's nothing down here in uh, U35 which is interesting um, so I mean bear in mind it's a, you know it's a, it's a different revision board it's not got some of the components um, yeah it's not got all of the same components populated strangely enough I don't think it's got that chip there which is uh, yeah, that one there which is a bit weird um, but it is I think this is probably a, a, the American version um, so um, yeah, I think I'll start by socketing up, uh, getting some sockets here for the, the, the DRAM, um, and we'll get a socket in there, remove those resistors. I'll make a note of where those are, I'll take a photo, just because I might have to put them back in if I, you know, if I can't get this chip working. Um, it's supposed to be new stock, this, but uh, yeah, we'll soon find out. Um, and then we'll just see what happens. I'm not sure how I'm going to be able to test it at this stage. I can go into the memory test, you know, the standard built-in self-test thing, see if that shows any different difference in behaviour. Um, that might be a clue, because um, I've not got a tape port or a disk drive or anything for this, but I have got a disk drive solution coming on the way, actually, which will be a, a future video. So there we go, uh, all the solder is unblocked. Uh, yeah, the board's a bit of a mess just because it's dirty. Once it's been cleaned up, it should look good as new. So looking at the top side of the board here, you can see these bypass capacitors um, to the left of each chip. You can see there C120, C119, 18, 17, etc. So I've unblocked the holes for those as well. Um, at this stage what you can do is just put it up to the light and actually look through, just make sure you can see through all of the holes there. Um, but it looks okay, I don't need to take any more solder off this side, it's all come off with the solder pump you know, via the other side of the board effectively. 
so yeah just make sure you brush it down um, but we'll get the sockets on there um, clean it up brush it down inspect it because you can get bits of particles of solder everywhere when you're using a desolder pump like I am um, and um, get the caps and the, the sockets on there um, I'm not sure about the cap size I might just uh, have a quick look at the schematics actually to work out what size these are here they're going to be something like uh, 0.33 uh, microfarads or something you know um, something around that maybe 100 nanofarads so here's just a part way uh, one thing I will point out when you stick these sockets on um, first of all solder one corner and then the other and then just inspect it from the top to make sure the sockets totally straight because you can see that right that's, that's about as straight as the other two but you can have them like that I don't know if you can see just tilted down towards this end slightly or that way you know you've got a little bit of movement there so as you get the first one on like I say make sure it's totally straight with regards to the chip to the left uh, and then repeat for each one you know just like I say just tack the corner points and just make sure it's totally straight and if it's not just heat it in the on the one corner where it's you know it needs an adjustment and then just straighten it up um, and then solder the remaining pins. I've done those two in entirety. I'll show you one or two as I get towards the end there, but it's not taking very long. It's taking about a minute to do those two. So here we go. This is the last socket going on. Uh, just solder one corner, leave it for two or three seconds. Bear in mind, I'm not using the temperature controlled iron here. I'm just using uh, a cheap C Class 15 watt iron. Uh, tack the corners. We'll inspect, make sure it's straight. Yeah, it's not quite straight, I just need to heat this pin and pull the chip with my finger on the other side down a little bit. Yeah, that's pretty straight now, so I can solder the remaining pins. So I cleaned the tip of my iron and we just need to heat for a second or two. The corner points where you've got, um, well not all the corner points, but wherever you've got a ground plane or a VCC rail just heat a little bit longer typically what I'll do is I'll go across and you see me going forwards and backwards on some of these actually just to equal the size of the solder on there um, just to make them a bit cleaner typically I'll sort of go across again like that just to get equal sizings just repeat this on this side so there we go all eight sockets on there and uh, all eight uh, bypass caps uh, 0.1 microfarads 100 nanofarads um, so I can get exactly the same type as these but the disc based ones they're fine they're fine for something like this so my favorite bit now cleaning up uh, with cotton buds and uh, IPA uh, lint free cotton swabs uh, your best bet really I'm gonna get loads of strands of cotton on here but I'm not gonna bother because I'm gonna be brushing it down in a minute I'll uh, pour some IPA uh, you know, fill a couple of caps of IPA, pour it uh, over there, and brush it down. Um, and the final thing is just to inspect it with a magnifier, just to make sure you've not got any shorts or anything anywhere, that the solder points look alright and none need touching up, and that we've not got any particles of solder uh, stuck on there. Sometimes they just stick on the PCB, they might not be stuck on a trace or anything, but they can just stick on the PCB, and if you don't uh, get rid of them, eventually they'll fall off. And, could cause you problems but yeah it's really m m mucky this it's just covered in flux but by the time I'm done it should uh, be good as new so that's after a few passes with two or three different cotton buds I've uh, got most of it off uh, and as I say what we'll do now is just uh, pour a bit of IPA over there not worried about it going all over the place uh, yeah and do a bit of this tilt the board at an angle just so you can uh, you know pour off the IPA and just repeat a few times and it should come up super super clean so just inspect with a magnifier you can see why you have to inspect this can you see uh, sorry I know we're awfully close here see there's just little bits of solder and just use a little tool like this the brush didn't get them off I can get them off and then just brush it down clean it up Reinspect, but you get them all over the place where you've used uh, a desolder pump. You know, you don't want to scratch the board, but you can just, so let's say, just touch them and come off. Yeah, so I've used more solder than were on the original chips, but uh, yeah, as you can see, yeah, that's not too bad. And there's obviously large blobs of solder on the bypass caps, as you can see. You've just got to make sure you get the, uh, you know, you inspect the right angle just to make sure those uh, connections of the bypass caps 
and not shorting onto anything. So rather than take a picture, actually, I thought I'd just film up close. It's just as good for my purposes, just so I can see where those uh, components, you know, little resistors uh, go there. They're probably just like zero ohm or something. I'm not sure. They're going to be very low resistance, I think. Um, but yeah, they were the solder. Remove those, get a socket on there, um, and get that new chip on. You could put a 14 pin socket on there, left aligned, you know, to pin one. Um, but this trace here is used, uh, I think there's one there as well. Okay. Yeah, I think so. It looks like it goes to that top one. So there are two connections here on the top side that are used on those six pins, uh, although not with this chip. I just wonder if Atari did that to support maybe another future model. Maybe it will go up to. Um, 256k or something I've got no idea but in any case I thought I'll fit this one just in case I decide to swap out that chip in some you know point in future and replace it with a gal or a pal or something else at least I've got the right size socket there I don't have to remove the socket and put a new one on so there we go socket soldered on uh, I can now get the chip in here um, initially I'm going to test it without any chips in here I'm just curious to see will it give will it boot will it give any memory errors will it only fail when it gets to the second half of the memory there or will it not even detect the memory at all I'm just you know curious to see the behavior it might even not work because this you know the chip the way it's going to be configured with this chip is it might actually be expecting this to be working um, it depends it might just boot and I might be able to get into the, the test mode like I say and see that half of the the RAM's bad um, and then I can introduce the RAM that's that's the theory anyway um, now it's worth noting there's different ways you can achieve something like this you don't necessarily need to go this route to upgrade one of these the memory on one of these uh, 65 XE's this way um, there's probably better ways and easier ways of doing it one of them is uh, and I'll post a link down below on the Lotharac website you can buy an upgrade module um, and I think it I think you remove the CPU uh, I don't know where the CPU is on this one uh, but you remove the CPU and I think one of the ROMs um, and stick uh, you know a couple of like little socketed things in there with an adapter and you've got a little PCB that sits somewhere that gives you I think like a meg or more um, I think it's a meg, I think it's a megabyte. Um, so if you do that, yeah, you've got to remove a couple of the larger dip chips, you know, the sort of 40 pin ones. Uh, but it's probably easier than trying to disol you know, clean up all the, uh, you know, the, the solder positions here, stick all the sockets on, stick all the caps on, stick on, you know, stick a socket here, you know, blah, blah, blah. There's an awful lot of work to do this. But I quite, quite like doing upgrades like this. It's kind of therapeutic, really. I've really enjoyed uh, expanding this by 64K. Um, and at the same time, is I will get the one meg RAM upgrade because uh, you can, you know, that will work with the 130, you know, the 128k or the 64k models as well. The RAM, the RAM upgrade that Lotharac sells. But it's always nice to have a fallback. You know, say for instance something went wrong with that RAM upgrade when I get it in future, I can always just remove it and sh touch wood and shove the 128k at least on the board. Um, so you know, it's, I like to just cover things from that angle. Really, it's always nice to have uh, different options. So it booted straight away there without that uh, additional 4164 DRAM. So uh, that's a good sign. And I've got straight into the uh, self test here by holding on the option key on uh, from a cold power up. Um, and we'll just let it go through the RAM. I'm just curious to see whether we get any indication because I don't know whether that RAM test is only going to go through and test 64K or will it detect that it should have 128K because I've added that little uh, Atari uh, eMMU chip there. Um, and will we see some failures halfway? Um, I'm hoping so. I'm hoping we do see failures because it's a good way of being able to test this before and after I've added the RAM. But also, it's a good way to be able to test DRAM. Now, it might not be um, very conclusive, it's not the ideal way to test DRAM, but I've been looking for something to test 4164 chips for a while. So as you can see, you've got eight uh, chips in here now. When I let that test go through, it just had three rows of RAM, um, they're all green, so I'm not sure whether this is complete. Maybe we need a jumper or a wire or something somewhere. Um, it could even be this chip down here, but like I say, when we looked at the photo of a, uh, an X, uh, 130XE board, didn't have anything there. So I'm not sure that's absolutely required for this. 
um, but there might be a link because there was can you see where there's um, an empty pad there that was where one of the links went across to one of the pads where you know the, the profile of where this chip was uh, or is now you know before there was a chip so there could be a wire required or something a link uh, I'm not sure uh, interesting thing with these chips is uh, in, in close inspection they're manufactured in West Germany so it shows you how old these these are a bit of history there you know these were pre uh, the Berlin Wall coming down um, yeah, I'll put the part number up uh, in a minute for that. I can't quite read it, but I'll stick it up here because they're a good alternative for 4164s. Uh, you know, they work quite well. So just testing the standard diagnostics mode here, you know, hold down option while you power it on. Um, it's given all green blocks. Now, I am testing without one of the chips at the moment. And you can see just down here I've removed one of the uh, DRAMs. In the second bank there, just because uh, well, I'll show you, show you in a minute. I'm going to load a memory test program, uh, and it, it finds four blocks, uh, which equals to 64k, and it tests them, says it's okay. Now the program is called XRAM, and I think it's testing exp like ex extra RAM, you know, expanded RAM, um, rather than just the base memory. I think, I think that's what's going on. Um, but I can't be a hundred percent sure. You know, I've not seen, I've not got any programs or anything here that, well, that I can tell that'll determine whether I've got 64k or 128k. It's, uh, yeah, a little bit hard to tell. Uh, I can test some 128k games and we'll see if those work all right. Uh, I tried Space Harrier a minute ago; that worked okay. Um, but I'm just not hundred percent sure. So I'll wait for this to go through to completion, then I'll show you that uh, XRAM test program in a minute. Yeah, that didn't give me any errors, so uh, I'll test it with the XRAM program now, I'll show you. It's loading that now. Um, so you can see, it's, you know, it's a bit cryptic as to what's going on here. Um, oh, so I have a good point, just uh, down here, it's, we've got four banks uh, equals 64k. So, uh, and it does say extended RAM test. So this is, presumably, it has actually detected I've got 64k there. And if I press A to do all, it seems to do them in four banks as you see the cursor move across and then you get a zero. Presumably that means there's zero failures. Uh, and you know it keeps going through those four banks there. And then it'll flash green at the end, just watch, it does it real quickly. It'll say okay, test done. So I'm assuming that's given me a you know a bill of good health there, I think. Um, let's just do that again, let's hit A. I'm assuming that it's detecting the 64k, because that's the way it logs from four banks equals 64k. Um, and then it's going through those four banks and we're just getting zeros and at the end it flashes green just briefly for a second and says done test's done and that's it so I'm assuming that's, that's it, it's as simple as that um, I'll load some 128k games and uh, let's just give it a test so I'm loading Space Harrier there, uh, I had to hold down option uh, you can see the thing I'm not sure about on this, can you see on the right hand side here? What's this bar? Uh, I'm just not sure that's right anyway, but if we hit start, the game does actually work. We've just got that really weird sort of thing going on on the right hand side. So I'm not um, sure what's going on there. Can you see it's like a, an overscan or something. The sound sounded a bit weird though as well, so... really weird. Not sure if that noise is the enemies. That sort of high pitch noise when they come on. Yeah, they seem to make that noise when they come past. Not sure if that's normal or not, uh, comments down below. Um, we'll try another 128k game, uh, just to be sure. So we'll try Mario Brothers XE here, uh, if we can find it. I'm guessing it might be in folder 1. Yeah, Mario Brothers XE. So let's try that, I'm going to hold down the option key. Right, option key's held down, hit fire. Final version for 130XE. So you would think if uh, this was working, this game should work. You know, if the RAM was right, this should work. It's 
loading away there. That's what that noise is, by the way. Start the game. So I've got press select four number of players. Uh, we don't want to do that. Option select level. And we just press start. Yeah. What's this working? I think. Granted, it's a bit slow. This is a 128k game. You can see it's working fine. I played the first few levels here up to level three, I think. I'm just on a bonus round. Um, it's a bit slow this game, but it's, uh, yeah, it's not bad. It's playable. Yeah, so I think it's working okay in 128k. Uh, I'll just see if I can find another 128k game, just to be sure. The thing is, this is Bug Hunt. I'm not sure whether this should work or not. From looking at the guides, it seems to suggest this needs an extra 64k. Uh, blocky or banky or whatever. Um, and this this is what happens, you know, this is withholding an option to, uh, you know, disable basic. So, you know, that's not working. Should that work? Does anybody know about that particular game? Um, I don't know, I'll try another game, but that, that, I've tried that a few times now and that's, that's the behaviour I'm getting with that game. I think it's the files themselves, I think dot .bin, you know, that dot .bin. I'm not sure if that's a cartridge image or something, I'm not sure. It does, you know, it obviously it appends its own loader or something, because when it boots up it does say it's, uh, it's got some sort of loader attached to it. And I'm just wondering if that's the problem with that game. I wonder if I loaded that on a, one of those side carts, whatever they're called. Um, stick it on ROM, you know, to boot it from ROM. It might be alright, uh, please, uh, as I say, please post in the comments below. Um, I'll try some just normal games and stuff on this now just to make sure it's working but the several games I've tried I've had no problems with it's just the, the few um, of these 128k ones and typically the ones that haven't booted have been these dot bins uh, so I'm not sure um, could even be just corrupt ROMs or something I'm not sure So all reassembled there uh, just testing some 64k games now actually uh, it's playing Goonies it's just loaded I think uh, but yeah, all done. Uh, hopefully you found that interesting. Thanks for watching. I'll see you soon.